Verehrte Festversammlung, liebe Gäste zur Beethoven Soiree. Esteemed guests of this Beethoven soiree, have you been touched by Beethoven's rays of joy? You, Professor Higuchi, were the conductor of this performance in Tokyo. You were the initiator of the Japanese translation. You were the publisher, you had the idea, and as a result of all this, we became friends. Most recently in discussions about the victims of Fukushima. And I believe at this moment of 150 years of German-Japanese friendship, there is a profound bond between us. Who does not know the famous last movement of the Ninth Symphony? Who's not experienced the kiss mentioned in the text as Beethoven's very personal message? But who has ever revealed the meaning of that kiss? When researching this aspect of Beethoven, I discovered that his Ode to Joy, which was adapted from Schiller's Ode to Joy, has been used as an anthem or national anthem in 156 countries of the world, starting in Russia and moving to Japan and even Zimbabwe in 1974 and still the enthusiasm remains undiminished to this day. In Japan, this same ode to joy is enthusiastically sung as the European Song of Welcome in kindergartens and even on the slopes of Fujiyama, or in my own personal experience, by the alma mater before one of my presentations. Gehen wir jetzt aber zurück und fragen, was sagt ein Zeitzeuge aus der Retrospektive vor zwei Going back 200 years, we have the testimony of the poet Grillparzer, who delivered Beethoven's eulogy and who wrote, A man passes with swift strides, together with his own shadow. Coming to a precipice, he takes a run, leaps, and lo, others are still toiling when he has reached the goal. And where he goes, Others cannot follow. We must ask today, can Grillparzer's claim, and where he goes, others cannot follow, still be maintained 200 years after it was formulated? As a result of recent research, and after the analysis of 2,000 biographies from around the world, we now realize that the path which Grillparzer could not yet discern has become a universal path for personal development, which has been experienced by people around the world. They were able to rise up out of despondency and uncertainty by means of the spiral path and attain active solidarity. The problem, as Professor Higuchi has just mentioned in speaking about Beethoven's tragedy, are Beethoven's contemporaries, who were simply not capable of adopting a perspective outside the context of their own time. Beethoven trod this path on his endless walks. He was able to make the leap, despite his failures and crises. The physical crisis, at 21 he began to notice his deafness. The artistic crisis, his death wish, thoughts about suicide, the political crisis, disillusionment, the economic crisis, he didn't own property, merely a brain, as he jokingly told his brother. And finally, the major identity crisis, he felt unloved throughout his life, even though he would be loved posthumously. How was it possible for such a person to succeed? Beethoven's motto was, O oh God, grant me the strength to overcome myself. Or, as he wrote in his diary, you must not be a man like other men, not for yourself, only for others. O oh God, grant me the strength to overcome myself. 
Clint hat das in seinem wunderbaren Beethoven Fries gestaltet als der wohl In his wonderful Beethoven Fries Klimt presented the well-armed strong one. In Gustav Mahler's anniversary year, I have to mention that the personal features of this figure are attributed to both Mahler and to Beethoven. It remains an open question. Both were fighters, searchers, both were marginalized by society. However, it is important to realize that the path which Beethoven so successfully adopted as his personal spiral path of life could not be shared by his contemporaries. His society was not capable of changing its perspective to understand the standpoint of others. His contemporaries were not capable of comprehending the empathetic support needed to bring about a change and a new, interlocking perspective. Society had not yet attained what we have today in the way of educational facilities, reinforced by integration and inclusion, namely comprehensive means of support. In order to make this shift in perspective more tangible, I'd like to use the example of Copernicus, who exemplified this change. Although it's slightly exaggerated, yet it makes this shift in thinking clearer. From a geocentric, or one could say an egocentric perspective, with the Earth rotating around its own axis, to a heliocentric perspective. And what this complementary path implies is beautifully exemplified in the famous dome of the German parliament. Visitors ascend on the right, turn around and descend on the left side. At the opening of the new parliament, I asked the architect, Sir Norman Foster, what's the philosophy behind your stone, glass and cement? He answered, there is simply no other way to climb up into the dome and then down again. The structure is a message in glass, steel and concrete. In order to demonstrate that this spiral has served as a model throughout the centuries in nature, culture and technology, I'll briefly give you a few examples. Here, the original spiral form of the galaxies, the complementary spiral waves of oxidation, or the famous complementary spirals of DNA. And on the cultural level, we have the entrance to the innermost sanctuary with a complementary spiral threshold. The third eye of the pharaoh, arising from the fire-spouting Uraeus, who developed out of the spiral snake. And finally, the complementary spiral staircase of the minaret of the Samara Mosque. In architecture, we find the famous eight-part path of salvation of the Temple of Barodbudur, the redemption spiral for a production of Faust for Expo 2000 in Hanover, and finally, the not yet built World Trade Center designed by Daniel Libeskind with the 1,776 steps ascending up the spiral stairway. Using this spiral path of life, I now want to refute Grillparzer's thesis by giving a brief overview of my research. It's based on 2,000 biographies from all over the world, of which 1,300 are in German and 700 others were translated. Included among these life crises are the well-known biographies of Schlingensief, Heaven Can't Be As Beautiful As It Is Here, or Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, Kenzaburo Oe of Japan, A Personal Matter, or Tagami, Berlin, Tokyo, and finally, not only Ludwig van Beethoven, but also Jean Amery on Suicide, A Discourse on Voluntary Death. All of these biographies are known to you from world literature, and I've been able to prove that each of these authors followed the spiral path of life. I've divided this literature into two sorts of crises, namely crises experienced during the course of life, which are foreseeable steps on the journey of life, birth, school, starting on a career, 
partnership, retirement, old age, death. They're predictable and can be foreseen. Even so, you'll find obituaries stating that a person died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 99. And, on the other hand, there are crises interrupting life, which particularly concern us. They change the routine of our normal lives in an instant and are especially relevant for Beethoven. For the individual, it could be the birth of a disabled child or childlessness, loss of a partner, loss of a job, accidents or sickness. Collectively, we would include natural disasters, such as Fukushima, violations of human rights, torture, war and terror. Naturally, these crises vary in nature. Looking back, you may observe that in the 1970s, the focus was primarily on disabilities. In the 1980s, the emphasis was on long-term illness, such as cancer and AIDS. In the 1990s, it was primarily terrible experiences, such as the Holocaust. And today, the attention is concentrated on sexual abuse and environmental disasters. To assist the reader, it was important to present this research in a bibliography which presented both the narrative perspective, the personal stories, those of the partner, mother, father, or the individuals with their specialists, as well as the classification by the type of crisis experienced. Today this is termed bibliotherapy. A book is a friend for people all over the world and can substitute for a partner in conversation. I now invite you to follow me through the phases of the spiral path of life and to discover for yourselves, on the basis of historical sources, how Beethoven was able to emerge victorious on his path. Just imagine for a moment that you or a person close to you were affected. You're faced with the news that you're sick, you have to envisage cancer or Alzheimer's, or that your child or grandchild was born with a handicap, or your partner was involved in an accident and would now have to live with paraplegia, or getting back to the present, you return to Japan after a business trip to Germany and you're informed at the airport, you've been orphaned, the tsunami has taken your family, your home, land and country is contaminated. You have to start all over again. The news hits you like a thunderbolt. The typical response is, I've been crushed. In a split second, life as you know it is destroyed. The person in the first spiral phase of uncertainty is stunned and asks himself, can this really have happened to me? Really happened, which to the experienced therapist means that in reality everything is in turmoil and disorder and that life has diverged from its normal course. Let us look at Beethoven. Beethoven experienced this phase of uncertainty when he was only 20. In a letter to his closest friends, he asked them to swear not to disclose his condition to others. He wrote to his friend, the theologian Amenda, My dear Amenda, your Beethoven is desperately unhappy. I beg you to keep the knowledge about my hearing as a secret, which should be entrusted to no one. I'm entangled in a dispute with God and the world. And to his friend Wiegler, who later became a physician, he wrote, your Beethoven is deteriorating. Now the jealous demon has allotted me a bad piece on the game board. I've often cursed my existence, my life and the Creator. I beg of you that my condition be revealed to no one, not even to Lorchen. In other words, Eleonora, Wegler's wife and her family. This is a secret that I entrust only to you. 
This uncertainty about his physical deafness was just one of Beethoven's concerns. Psychosocially, there were many more uncertainties. Let us look at the sources. There was the uncertainty about his birth, age and origins. Up until his death, he refused to acknowledge his birth certificate and said, this doesn't belong to me, it's my brother's. I'm not his substitute. As for his age, he never knew how old he was. His father continually made him younger. Here you can read that the ten-year-old wrote the variations on a funeral march. On the score is written, âgé de dix ans, although he was already twelve. Then there is the song of the ten-year-old boy, just like you, Jan. At the age of ten, he wrote his first song to a baby. You do not yet know whose child you are. He didn't know who his parents were. He could not believe that he was the offspring of his alcoholic father and believed that he was descended from the imperial family. This double uncertainty was symbolic of his life. Our pianist, Konstantin Bazantny, wrote in reference to my book, the Hammerklavier Sonata, the longest monologue in piano literature, is Beethoven's spiral path of life in eight phases. And he has recorded this performance for us. Let's now listen to the first spiral phase in the first movement of the Hammerklavier Sonata, Allegro, introduction of the main theme. One can analyze the Hammerklavier Sonata as a complete series of all the spiral phases. The spiral phase of uncertainty dominates Beethoven's entire first movement. Here at the beginning, he attempts to be the unconquered strong fighter as we know him. But then he wanders off into a hopeless conflict of polyphonic parts out of which he can only extricate himself with difficulty and willpower, enabling a return to the point of the forceful beginning. Beethoven then swings from one positive major tonality to another. The second theme actually ought to be in F major, according to the rules for a sonata main movement. However, Beethoven avoids this key. He denies it as he continues with the combative D major, which then leads to a joyful G major. Even in the reprise, he leaves the main key of B-flat major in the first thematic complex, but then seems to get completely lost in G-sharp major. By turning to a key that Beethoven called the black tonality, B minor, can he achieve a breakthrough after bitter struggles, returning to B flat major as if nothing had happened. But the breakthrough had been achieved. <laughs> 
Zusammenbruch war da. Inevitably, the stage of certainty arrived, the second spiral phase. Yes, but surely that can't be true. The head says yes, but the heart says no, refusing to accept something that simply cannot be. Beethoven, restricted by his own vow not to speak about his condition, confides only in his last will and testament. It does not have a title. It is simply addressed to his brother Karl, followed by a blank space as he remained irreconciled with his family. It begins, O you men who think or say that I am malevolent, stubborn or misanthropic, how greatly do you wrong me? You do not know the secret causes of my suffering. Here Beethoven described his personal suffering through his environment 200 years ago. My misfortune is doubly severe from being misunderstood. I must live as if exiled. In his increasing desperation, he goes to Heiligenstadt, where he drafts his will. But the most important feature of this testament is the final sentence, which appears upside down, because it was written after the two-page document had been folded. I've turned it around so you can read the lines. O Providence! Grant me but one day of pure joy. For me, never. No, oh, that would be too hard. Today we realize that the 28-year-old Beethoven needed to wait till the 56th year of his life, almost another 28 years, until his ode to joy could be brought forth through the process of overcoming his crises. That Beethoven suffered bitterly in his conflict with his own society can be comprehended with the rule of irrelevance, always to carry on, never mentioning what things are really like. Once, as he walked through Heiligenstadt with his pupil, Ries, his companion remarked, did you hear the shepherd's flute? Beethoven said no, to which Ries replied, that was nothing, I didn't hear anything either. Beethoven noted in his will, what a humiliation, and described this occurrence, though without mentioning Ries by name. And Ries and Beethoven's society also had to wait 35 years before recognizing the spiritual change exemplified by Copernicus until Ries could reveal the truth in his biography of Beethoven, published 10 years after Beethoven's death. These constant occasions of denial, suppression and repression resulted in Beethoven being continually misunderstood so that he had to make amends with gifts of reconciliation. He gave his friend Amenda a string quartet and wrote, let this be a remembrance of our friendship. He gave his friend Breuning a lovely miniature painting on ivory and wrote, behind this painting be forever hidden what stood between us for so long. If the person concerned has a companion, he or she can discover or hear the truth in small doses. If there is no one, there is no alternative to the brutal exposure of the truth. This is realized in the second movement of the Hammerklavier Sonata, Scherzo, as follows. In the Scherzo, Beethoven leaps around youthfully only to succumb once again after seven, instead of the usual eight bars, to deep depression. The 
Beethoven emphasizes all the wrong places. The passages become almost beatless. One can hardly determine the first beat of a bar. He continues this throughout the movement. Es kann nicht ausbleiben, dass der Betroffene früher oder später aus dem Kopf gesteuerten Stadium und der Unavoidably, the person experiencing the initial stage in a purely rational way will eventually, as a result of repressed feelings, erupt in an irrational explosion of emotion and aggression. He or she will exclaim, why me? No one ever asks, why not me? And as a result, Beethoven broke out into a fit of rage, he was a master at this, against all kinds of irritations, because the true source of the aggression, his deafness, couldn't be approached. And now I'd like to ask you, what do you do with your aggression? I can see by your smiles that you carry the knowledge of this secret in yourself. I can only reveal my aggression where I'm loved, in a space from which I will never be excluded. And therefore it is my deep conviction that aggression is an expression of love. Beethoven provided us with countless of these proofs of love. One of them has become known as the Teplitz incident. Here you see Beethoven at the spa with Goethe, who respectfully bows his head, while Beethoven strides proudly erect through a group of the imperial family. Likewise demonstrating that aggression is an expression of love, Beethoven was able to ban his closest friend and pupil Ries, his patron Lichnowsky, and the mother of Grillparzer from ever listening to him while he lived. And what was the reason? After Ries had heard Beethoven compose, he visited Lichnowsky and reported that he has just composed a wonderful work. Lichnowsky said, then play it for me, and Ries complied. Wishing to surprise Beethoven, Lichnowsky played it for him the next morning. Beethoven felt betrayed. You're stealing my ideas. And Ries was never allowed to listen to him again. When Lichnowsky approached him and said, it was my fault, I made him do it, Ries played the music for me in the evening. Beethoven banned Lichnowsky from listening, and he would no longer perform at his receptions or concerts. And finally, a third example, Grillparzer's mother. She lived in Heiligenstadt in the same house as Beethoven, sharing a stairwell where she would listen to him playing the piano. Upset, Beethoven would never again play the piano in Heiligenstadt. The most famous example of aggression is the hole ripped in the Eroica score when Beethoven cried out, Napoleon, to whom I dedicated a symphony on freedom, equality and fraternity, that upstart has crowned himself emperor, deleting his name in anger. We can hear the third spiral phase in the Hammerklavier Sonata. At the conclusion, he falls into a fit of anger, alternating between B-flat and B, these contrasting notes, then he pounds aggressively on the B-flat. At this point, he attempts to smile a little, as if nothing had happened. But there can be no doubt about what is happening. It's part of the course that parallel to the aggression, the phase of negotiation is developing. If, then must I? One deals with physicians, with miracles, with God. One goes shopping in the warehouse of medical remedies. So Beethoven went to Teplitz, to Heiligenstadt and to Marienbad and endured all the treatments, negotiating with miracles. 
In his search, Beethoven invented fictional dialogues. He was plagued by imaginary persons, writing to his physician, doctor locks the door to death. Death, notes equals money, can rescue from distress. That was the light-hearted argument with his physician to whom he turned for treatment. Much more dramatic were his bargainings for his nephew, Karl, a substitute love. There is endless documentation dealing with this long legal process in which he maintained that he had obtained the sole right of bringing up his nephew from his older brother on his deathbed. Throughout his life, this was challenged by Karl's mother. Beethoven became so angry that he wrote, he's already an utter good for nothing. My love for him has disappeared. He needed it. I don't need his. One has to ask, when someone says such a thing, what is left unsaid? And eventually Beethoven concluded, everybody knows that what I said isn't true. The tragedy of the whole process was that the moment he succeeded, Karl attempted suicide. Beethoven died eight months later. This is expressed in the Hammerklavier Sonata, third movement adagio, as followed. Now the composer challenges his impressions, and in the slow third movement, he holds one of the longest and most profound monologues in piano literature. It lasts 20 minutes. Everything that depresses him is put on the table. Every key, whether major or minor, is examined and reviewed for its veracity. Even a key that doesn't really exist, which can only be expressed in notation by means of reconstructions. D-sharp major is drawn upon. One often has the impression that Beethoven has finally found his peace with one or the other of these thoughts, usually in the G major of joyful childhood memories or the F major of the loftiest intellect and spirit. But just when one thinks that he can finally bring the piece to a conclusion, thoughts of dissatisfaction once again unsettle the composer. He negotiates between the keys.
Inevitably, depression, fifth spiral phase sets in, almost like mourning. Why? Everything is meaningless. It's well known that Ludwig van Beethoven was haunted even in his youth by thoughts of death. His funeral cantata, Lost, composed at the age of 10. Variations on a funeral march of the 10-year-old, but actually 12. Christ on the Mount of Olives, the Gellert leader, the famous funeral march in the Eroica, the chorus of prisoners in Fidelio, the Schicksal Symphony, Fate Symphony. All these examples have the victory of the hero as a theme and his cathartic transformation through his own death. Next to the death motif, a central theme was unrequited love. Beethoven had 28 snubs or rejections of his proposals have been documented. And it is still an open question whether the famous letter to the immortal beloved was written to an imaginary lover in the process of overcoming crises. It's unusual that this letter does not include the name or address of the recipient. The literature on this letter takes up many meters of shelf space. We found the original together with the Heiligenstadt Testament in his writing desk. We live in the age of the copy shop. Who copied this letter, if indeed it was copied? Does one give a love letter to a copyist? And since we now know that Beethoven didn't write his testament in order to leave his estate, but rather to justify himself, oh, you men who think or say that I'm malevolent, stubborn or misanthropic, then was the letter written to justify what troubled him? Let's remember that Fidelio was a lover. The darkness of the mourning process can be exemplified in the painting by the artist Dorel Dobokan, who created this image while his wife was suffering from a brain tumor and he was on a hunger strike in Romania. And I believe he presented it to me so that it could be published on the cover of my book Why Me, of which you, Mr. Ruprecht, were the publisher. You can see the darkness of the portrait, with a face radiating out of the darkness with a diagonal of hope. The lips are ready to speak, the eyes half open, ready to pass from the intermediate stage of doubt, violent emotion, into the final stage of active, autonomous acceptance, sixth spiral phase. This is expressed in the Hammerklavier Sonata as follows. After negotiating unsuccessfully between the positive G major and F sharp major keys, Beethoven falls into a deep depression. He recalls the beginning of the movement, only this time it is darker and more sorrowful. At the end, he again attempts to establish a small glimmer of hope by first playing the mournful chords and then introducing this very tender F-sharp major key. Thank you. 
The sufferer has arrived at the darkest, deepest point of the will, but now he has terra firma under his feet. He can push himself up independently and search for his own path. This is the sixth spiral phase stage of acceptance. Now I can see. One doesn't look back at what has been lost, like Lot in the Bible. One concentrates on what remains and what can now be achieved. Acceptance is not yet positive approval, but it is the phase of maturing. It's a tightrope walk, proceeding right up to the border and daring to take the next step. Beethoven appears to have reached this acceptance when he realized the meaning of his suffering. He writes to Countess Erdödy, a fellow sufferer, We who are finite were both born with an unlimited capacity for sorrow and joy. He adds, you could almost say that we have been blessed with joy through sorrow. Und er fügt hinzu, beinahe könnte man sagen, wir sind Auserwählte durch Leiden zur Freude. Here he is presented alone, he is at peace with his deafness, he is being at odds with society. Beethoven beside a brook, composing the pastoral symphony. He made fun of himself, I never come without my flag, my notebook, and then said, you ask me where I get my ideas? They come unsummoned. All I need to do is translate what God sends me into sounds and set them down in notes. This was acceptance for Beethoven, being at one. In the Hammerklavier Sonata, this state of mind is represented as follows. This acceptance figures in the introduction, where Beethoven turns to the pastoral F major key, which he previously consistently avoided in the first movement. Here, it has the effect of redemption. At the end of this introduction, he even accepts his weaknesses as a kind of limp, which he now humorously makes light of. We can see that he is making progress, because the burden of the process of overcoming has lessened. He no longer looks back but ahead in the direction of activity. One can express this either in works of art or in the foundation of institutions at regional, national or international level. Therefore, it is no accident that Beethoven, upon reaching the seventh spiral phase, in other words, activity, is said to have spoken the famous sentence which I've added in Japanese. The crosses people have to bear in life are like the crosses or sharps in the music. They raise us up. We can recognize how this double cross is experienced when we look at Edvard Munch's painting The Scream, an autobiographical scream. 
Or one could think of The Ugly Duckling by Hans Christian Andersen, an autobiographical tale. Finally, there are the lively stuffed animals created by Margarete Steiff, despite her disability, which traveled as cultural ambassadors to places as far away as Kyoto. This activity can be heard in the Hammerklavier Sonata in the fugue of the fourth movement. Beethoven chooses a fugue for the last movement. Why? Actually, a completely different movement should appear at this point. But a fugue is easily recognizable as a polyphonic conflict between several voices which are equal, yet independent of one another. As a consequence, there is no strict sequence of keys, as is usual in the sonata form. Each key is equal, each part is equal. The fugue is therefore the form of equality. We now come to the final eighth spiral phase of solidarity. We'll get through this together. It's now no longer a matter of reflecting on one's personality, but rather of what can be done for society. In this phase, Beethoven not only composed his Ninth Symphony, the last string quartets and the Missa Solemnis, he also experienced the solidarity of reconciliation. Beethoven didn't receive solidarity from his society, rather he created it himself with his art, through reflection. You can see this in his scores, as in the score of the Ninth Symphony, in which he made notes in the margins writing, Oh friends, not these tones. The friends are not really there, but Beethoven imagines them and exclaims, Let us raise our voices in more pleasing and more joyful sounds. He adds, be embraced, millions. These millions do not exist in reality, but his desire to relate is so intense that he addresses them. And finally, there's his jubilation, as represented in this caricature. It was so great that he breaks all the rules of music history and transforms the category of the symphony into vocal music. In the margin he wrote, ha, ah, this is it. I myself will sing joy, beautiful spark of the gods. And what's equally astounding, I'm so grateful to Konstantin Bazantny for bringing this to my attention, in the last 12 bars of the Hammerklavier Sonata, we find the eight-phase spiral leaps of the jubilant Beethoven. In conclusion, Beethoven summarizes the whole sonata into a 12-bar formula with the octave trills leaping out from the depths, followed by a downward leap in order to jump up to an even higher octave trill. Rising chromatically, he repeats the spiral movement to higher and higher levels, as if he wishes to say that life might be difficult, but he will strive ever upward as in a spiral. One should never give up. Commenting on the ultimate expression of joy 
which developed in the 28 years from the Heiligenstadt Testament to culminate in the Ninth Symphony and the Hammerklavier Sonata, musicians have written, and Sophie Mutter, Ludwig van Beethoven's embracing thoughts have given me enormous strength. Or Mazur, Ludwig van Beethoven, for me that is to experience happiness, for me a miracle. But once again, I'd like to emphasize that Beethoven's spiral path of life is also to be found in the visual arts. The spiral labyrinth in the cathedral of Chartres. Or the spiral path, judgment of hell, frieze of Dante's divine comedy, an eight-phase spiral path of enlightenment. The eight-phase spiral path of knowledge, Jesus in the temple. The threads forming spirals around the face of Christ, in the kerchief of Veronica, radiating out from the oldest, most archaic sense organ, the nose, which unites the past, present and the future. The starry night created by Vincent van Gogh, who before his death again represented the heavens as a double spiral. Here it's the path of enlightenment of the pilgrim Sudama on the path to the holy Punjab the pilgrim's spiral path to the heavenly Jerusalem in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and finally spiral-like coils of the Scala Elisiodale in the Museum Library of the Vatican. We have followed Beethoven's spiral path from his 28th to 56th year of life as a spiral path of life. We can recognize that the path that he forged is a well-worn universal spiral path of life a creative leap out of crises. But at the same time, we have to remember that it was only possible for Beethoven to follow this path as an individual, given that the society of his time was not capable of changing its modes of thought. As Professor Higuchi has already indicated, today it's become possible by means of my complementary model to learn to overcome conflicts in other ways. For Beethoven's contemporary society, the change began after his death, namely on the day of his funeral. On his deathbed, he was supported only by Rees and English finance. On the day of his funeral, 30,000 people assembled in Schwarzspania Square, among them Grillparzer, to accompany him to his last resting place. And posthumously, 200 years later, the world honors Beethoven in 1972 in accepting the Ninth Symphony as the hymn of Europe, and once again in 2003, when the Ninth Symphony was entered into the list of UNESCO documents of world culture. And not only that, this creative leap continues right up to the present, when, with Germany's reunification, we were presented with the gift of another very special creative leap. The manuscript of the Ode to Joy was divided between East and West Berlin, but with reunification the two parts could again be united. The same is true in Beethoven's second city, Vienna. The famous Beethoven frieze was created by Klimt 100 years after Beethoven's spiritual death in 1802, expressed in the Heiligenstadt Testament. It was so despised that the work was sawn into seven pieces and thrown away, but it was saved by one of Klimt's patrons, and a hundred years later it was reassembled. A creative marvel. It's become a place of pilgrimage, a magnet for visitors to Vienna. Therefore, we can say, Beethoven has experienced posthumously the universal and personal respect and love denied him during his life. One could say he has become an example of the complementary concepts, the sick, healthy person, the healthy sufferer, the seeker of health, the health giver, the mortally unloved, the immortal beloved. Why? 
The Heiligenstadt Testament symbolized on the one hand the death of Beethoven, but at the same time, due to the composer's willpower and desire to overcome the obstacles, it resulted in a new birth, a resurrection, thanks alone to the God-given gift of music. He wrote in his diary, a small courtyard, a small chapel, in which the song is created by me, in praise of the Almighty, the Eternal, the Infinite.